Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for coming out for another edition of our virtual museum. Uh, today we have a fantastic presentation from Mr. Mark Connor. Uh, he's a retired businessman with a degree in anthropology from Brown University and po postgraduate study in archaeology from the University Museum at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's participated in archaeological surveys in the United States and the United Kingdom and holds an MBA degree from Lehigh University. Today he's going to be talking about the President's Pump, uh, the largest steam-driven single-cylinder single stationary water pumping engine in the Americas, uh, which is actually built just a few miles away from the National Museum of Industrial History. Um, if you've checked out some of our other presentations, we're going to have recordings of those up on our website. And if you missed some of this one, we'll also have a recording of this on our Facebook page and our website as well. Uh, if you're able to, uh, right now, the museum has a couple ways that you can help support us. Uh, obviously, we're closed right now, so uh, things are tough. And if you're able to, there's a couple different ways you can help. One is using uh, Amazon Smile. So if you're using uh, Amazon to order anything online, part of your order will uh, go to the National Museum of Industrial History. Um, you can purchase memberships, adopt artifacts, and uh, several other ways. So if you check out nmih.org, you can find out uh, how to help us and check out the other presentations that are coming up throughout the week. And I'm gonna pass it over to Mark. Thanks, Mark, so much for joining us. Thank you, Glenn, and uh, welcome everybody. I, this is my first time using uh, Zoom, so uh, please uh, be gentle with me. Uh, it's a new technology. I think in the last two weeks, uh, I think we've all been learning new things that we've never done before, so uh, at difficult times. And uh, just to underscore what Glenn said, uh, it is a wonderful time to support um, uh, the National Museum of Industrial History. There, there, are not, there are not too many places in America which really focus on our fantastic uh, industrial heritage. Um, really a, a subject that uh, made us uh, very uh, special in the entire world. I mean, it's really kind of our, our, some of our 19th century plants and manufacturing capability in the 20th century uh, is, uh, as I said, the impact on the world is uh, tremendous. So uh, this museum celebrates that history and it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, when this uh, current crisis is over, um, please uh, come back in, to the National Museum and see the uh, fantastic displays that are there. So our subject today is uh, zinc mining in Friedensville and the birth of the U.S. zinc industry. Uh, the two photos, the one on the left is a, a picture from a photograph from 1876 of the mines in Friedensville, uh, and on the right is the um, plant that was located in, uh, in Bethlehem. If you're familiar with uh, Bethlehem, it uh, was located where uh, the New Street Bridge is today. And uh, that was uh, where the zinc ore that was mined in Friedensville, which is about four miles south of Bethlehem, was taken and there it was uh, smelted and transformed into zinc products and then shipped on by railroad from there uh, you know, throughout the country. So, um, We'll start with, uh, you know, what is zinc? <clears throat> uh, a lot of people uh, say zinc, well, you know, you, you, you can't really see it. Uh, you don't necessarily pick up a piece of zinc uh, uh, unless you have a, a penny that was minted in uh, World War II uh, for a period of time that were made out of zinc. But zinc is actually the uh, fourth most common metal uh, after iron, aluminum, and copper. Uh, it most commonly is found as sphalerite, as uh, it's the most common zinc ore. That, uh, that ore does contain a lot of sulfur, and, uh, which uh, obviously needs to be burned off in order to get to the ore. Uh, the uses traditionally are uh, medical and cosmetics. Uh, you may have, uh, at some point in your life, put uh, uh, zinc oxide on your nose, turns your nose white, but that's, uh, that's uh, one of the medical uses of zinc. Uh, the other big use is as brass. Z brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. Brass is a, a material that's uh, used in many products, uh, a lot of naval applications as well as uh, as well as uh, military applications for brass historically. Uh, as a pain additive, um, zinc was known even back in the 19th century to be a better additive uh, to make paint water and to uh, safer than lead as an additive. So uh, one of the early uses for zinc was as an additive to paint and as an anti-corrosion plating for galvanizing. 
newer uses, more 20th and 21st century uses are in the aerospace, uh, in batteries, cathodic protection. Uh, the picture on the right there is actually a core sample of the uh, zinc deposit in Freedensville from our 20th century mining activities. And you can see in, in Freedensville, the zinc has a kind of a grayish, uh, grayish appearance. So really, uh, when we look at uh, zinc mining in America, it really started in, in two places. It started here in Bethlehem at the uh, Freedensville mines uh, with the uh, product being taken into the city of Bethlehem for processing. And uh, also almost concurrently in uh, New Jersey. Uh, there were mines in Sussex County, New Jersey, uh, Newton area, Franklin area. And uh, there that product was uh, taken into uh, the Newark uh, Passaic area for, for processing. And uh, this all occurred uh, in the early 1850s. The uh, mines in Freensville, we, we actually are, actually were five mines that were operating in the uh, 19th century. The largest was known as the Uberoth mine, but then there were an, a number of others all in the Freensville area. You can see here the the Freedensville Church is um, there uh, at the crossroads. So if you know the area, this is Old Bethlehem Pike. And uh, there, there's a very attractive old Lutheran church called Freedensville Church. So all these mines are in that area. And there were five of them all together, uh, the Uberoth being the largest. You see the names like Uberoth, Hartman, um, Corel. Uh, the typical practice back then is you name the mine after the landowner. In the case of, uh, uh, as I said, the largest one, the gentleman's name was Uberoth. So uh, it all started here on his farm, Jacob Uberoth. Uh, and if you, again, you're familiar with the area, you'll recognize this house. And in particular, the uh, large sycamore tree, 200-year-old sycamore tree that's out front. And this was his farm. And, and the farmer, uh, Jacob Uberoth, in the 1840s, had, uh, had fields where he had a difficulty growing crops. And back then farmers would, uh, would, uh, would take uh, uh, limestone, other materials, limestone really from their fields, burn it in kilns to create lime. And he was taking uh, stones into his lime kilns and he, it was turning out to be, it was solidifying into metals and it wasn't really burning uh, the way he expected it to. So he knew he had something different and uh, in 1845, he took uh, some, of the, uh, some of these stones that he was uh, getting from his field to a local chemist by the name of uh, Theodore Roper. And uh, Roper was able to take the, the materials and uh, combine it with copper in a laboratory setting and, uh, and uh, create brass. So he, he uh, determined that this was a, a zinc product that uh, or zinc rich ore that uh, Uberoth had in his mines. Well, that was great, except for in 1845, there wasn't any process in America to be able to take zinc ore and transform it into, uh, uh, into uh, zinc. So uh, uh, Uber, Uberoth, Roper, and a uh, 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 merchant from the Philadelphia area were sending uh, samples to England, trying to make uh, zinc ore or zinc out of the ore, and we're not able to do so. And so uh, this went on for about a decade until uh, two uh, gentlemen from Philadelphia got involved. Uh, one was uh, named Samuel Wetherill, and the other was uh, Joseph Wharton. Uh, Samuel Wetherill got involved first. Wetherill was uh, from a Philadelphia Quaker family, prominent family that was involved in uh, in various businesses, uh, one of which was uh, making paint. And um, uh, Samuel himself was a chemist and inventor, and he was able to come up with the first U.S. process to take zinc ox, to, to take zinc ore, and to turn it into zinc uh, product. And uh, so he took this patent, and in 1853, uh, along with investors, built a plant, uh, as we mentioned, in uh, or near uh, where the New Street Bridge is uh, now. This was, at the time, that town was called South, South Bethlehem. And uh, built the plant. And uh, it was going well for about a year, and the plant burned down. Uh, the Philadelphia investors uh, became kind of nervous. 
what they were finding is that Samuel was an excellent inventor and uh, creator, good creative mind, but he was a terrible businessman. He was, uh, uh, in addition to his plan, he built a racetrack around the outside of the plan and was uh, running races and, uh, and uh, you know, his employees loved him, but uh, the investors didn't. Uh, they were not seeing a return on their investment. So they decided they needed to do something different. So they brought in another younger young man, a fellow by the name of Joseph Wharton, also from a Philadelphia, prominent Philadelphia family. And they said, uh, you know, Joseph, you need to take over this operation and turn it into something. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, Samuel Weatherall and Joseph Wharton didn't hit it off very well uh, because uh, you know Wharton came in to really take over his operation. Uh, but uh, Joseph Wharton did have a good uh, commercial mind and was able to take, uh, uh, take this plant, um, uh, rebuild it, get it back operating in a profitable way, added new products. He was able to not only make zinc oxide, which uh, was used uh, principally in paint, but he also was able to add uh, capabilities to make a metallic zinc which could be used for other products and then eventually even uh, added a, a rolling mill. So uh, really turned it profitable. And uh, by the time we got to the Civil War period, and you can imagine in the Civil War, uh, the needs for brass were immense with for, for buttons and uh, 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 brass cartridges for guns. So, so there, there was a huge amount of demand for brass during, during the uh, Civil War and the company was, was quite profitable. Uh, the mine and the plant in South Bethlehem represented about two thirds of the of United States zinc production by that time. So, uh, so it not only was profitable, but it was really the first uh, truly successful commercial uh, uh, application of, of uh, zinc production in the United States. Now, Joseph Wharton, uh, you may recognize that name. He actually, pulled out of the business in 1863, right in the middle of the Civil War, right in the middle of it being most profitable, but he, showed, he, he uh, sold his interest and then moved on to, uh, uh, to invest in uh, really cornering the U.S. Um, uh, uh, market for, uh, uh, for nickel. And uh, he had a lot of connections. He had a lot of connections in, uh, in Washington and when uh, the Civil War actually ended in 1865, uh, you may remember, during the war, we, we, uh, during that war, we stopped making uh, 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 coinage, it was uh, paper money, but uh, brought coinage, coinage back after the Civil War. The five cent civil, uh, silver piece that, it, that we had before the Civil War came back uh, in 1865 as the five cent nickel coin. So. Uh, so he, uh, he did quite well. He made his first fortune in Friedensville. He built that fortune up to, uh, uh, to really becoming one of the great industrialists of the 19th century, was one of the early investors in Bethlehem Steel. And uh, uh, he is also gives his name to the Wharton School of Business in University of Pennsylvania. He's also one of the founders of Swarthmore College. So uh, although he left his investment in Bethlehem in 1863, he went on to uh, to, uh, to uh, far greater heights uh, uh, later in the, in the century. So let's uh, get back uh, to look at the Uberoth mine, uh, the largest mine that we have in Friedensville. It really started out by mining the surface. Uh, they were finding uh, uh, zinc rich uh, uh, rocks right on the surface and they're using those uh, uh, initially. But uh, as those uh, ran out, they had to go down deeper and you can see here, this, uh, this uh, picture uh, shows a, uh, a pit. This is actually represents a pit. And they started digging a pit. And as they dig that pit, dug that pit, what they did is they started to actually go uh, veins, uh, horizontal veins, uh, where they followed the zinc ore underground. And uh, so uh, the mine there in, uh, in Friedensville, this largest one, is both a surface uh, pit as well as underground uh, uh, channels underground where they found the rich veins. And as they went deeper, uh, when they went down to start to get to uh, lower levels, uh, 100 feet, 
they started to encounter a great deal of water. So they were adding uh, pumps as they went along, uh, steam-driven pumps, uh, two, three pumps, four pumps, trying to deal with this water. But the water was becoming more and more of a problem. And they were finding that the uh, conventional pumps that they were using just couldn't handle it. So uh, they had a rich mine. They were, uh, we, we were dealing with a company that was really uh, predominant in the zinc industry. They wanted to continue to exploit it. But uh, you can't uh, mine in half, uh, you can't mine under, underwater. So uh, they had to have a way to deal with this water. So uh, uh, what, do you, uh, what they were dealing with really was uh, what became known as the wettest mine in America. And this is a quote from the uh, latter part of the 19th century, but one of the mine engineers said the water had to be fought by pumps throughout every foot sunk for every minute in the life of the mine. And just to give a sense for the amount of water they had to deal with, this actually is a photograph from 1950s when uh, New Jersey Zinc reopened the mines. And you can see a mining engineer down at 400 feet underground and the amount of water flowing into the mine. You can see it on the on the rock face in the, in the background. So it was uh, uh, dealing with a tremendous amount of rind, tremendous amount of water, which uh, as I said is uh, um, mining, uh, people will say this was by far the wettest mine uh, they've ever had to deal with. So in the 19th century, when you're trying to deal with a mine that turned out to be the wettest mine in America, and all the conventional tools that you had wasn't working, what did you do? And here the investors are sitting around the table to sign, well, what do we do? Who do we call? How do we solve this problem? And there was really only one place that you would go in the 19th century if you had a mining problem and a water problem and you needed to solve it. You'd call a Cornish guy. They said, well, why would you call a Cornish guy? Well, in the uh, middle part of the 19th century, um, uh, Corn Corn Cornwall and Cornish engineers were known throughout the world for their capabilities. Uh, Cornwall, and I just to level set where that is, Cornwall is that boot at the bottom of, of, uh, of Britain. Uh, that's uh, it's a, a small area uh, right at the, as I said, at the boot, the boot of, of the England. And uh, it's an area that's extremely rich in uh, hard minerals. Uh, and at the time in 1850, Cornwall mined and processed about half the world's production of both copper and tin. And um, Cornish engineers were, were known for their capabilities in terms of mining, but also in steam technology. So you have to uh, picture Cornwall as a place where uh, very rich in minerals, but has very little running water. So the conventional use of water wheels uh, to uh, help uh, uh, with, uh, with labor and, and, and and, and working mines, uh, not, not a lot of running water to deal with. So when, when steam technology came along in the early part of the 18th century, uh, Cornwall was a very early adopter of steam technology. So from the very first uh, steam uh, uh, engines by Thomas Newcomen and James, uh, James Watt, uh, Cornwall quickly adopted these. Uh, they were also very incented to become efficient with using steam engines because Although Cornwall has a great deal of copper and tin, the one thing it doesn't have is coal. So coal had to be imported from Wales or the Midlands of England. And, uh, and so, uh, so it was expensive to get there. So uh, Cornish engineers became very adept at not only uh, steam technology, but how to do steam technology efficiently. So what did our and, and Philadelphia investors who were trying to work the uh, the mines in Friedensville do, they, they, called a, uh, they called one of the uh, more prominent Cornish engineers. And they charged him with, with uh, creating a pump, a pumping engine that could, uh, uh, that could pull 17,000 gallons of water a minute uh, or 25 million gallons a day. How can you do that? I mean, this was unknown. And uh, he created an engine, he started in 1868 and the engine was actually uh, finished in uh, 1872, inaugurated in 1872. And this engine uh, weighed uh, 675 tons. It had uh, two, uh, two what they call lattice work walking beams, that's this uh, element up here, that weighed uh, 95 tons. 
and it rested on a wall that was uh, nine feet thick. And uh, the cylinder on this uh, on the steam engine, this uh, element here, was uh, nine feet in diameter. These flywheels that helped uh, helped uh, drive the cylinder were uh, thirty feet in diameter. And uh, this engine, single and single cylinder engine, was capable of uh, producing up to three thousand horsepower. In order to operate it, they had uh, twenty operating steam boilers. Uh, that were in a building that was adjacent to the engine house. And this ran continuously from 1872 until 1876. Uh, the pump shaft was uh, about uh, 240 feet deep. Uh, these are the pump rods here that uh, drove uh, down, into the, down into the pump shaft that was pushing uh, lift and plunger pumps uh, down in the shaft that pushed the water out. Uh, the water came out of the mines and was pushed to a uh, through a tunnel or audit to a tributary of the South Saucon Creek. And so it ran from 1872 to 1876, and then ran again from uh, 1881 to 1892. There was a brief period of time, 1876 to 1881, where the mines didn't operate um, because uh, the actual cost of getting the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ore out of the mines was not uh, cost effective compared to other sources. Uh, you can imagine uh, what this did to the cost stack to have to, uh, to run this engine because it was uh, consuming about 800 tons of coal a month. And uh, that added uh, four to six dollars to the cost stack uh, that other uh, uh, areas, uh, pr principally northern Jersey, uh, where their zinc ore was not uh, found in uh, in a mine that uh, was uh, that had a water problem, uh, didn't have that uh, cost element to deal with. So, despite the uh, fact that the mine had very rich ore with very good quality, there was a period of time when they didn't operate. Although, when the zinc prices uh, got stronger again, uh, the mine did run again from uh, 1881 to 1892, and uh, during that period of time, the uh, the uh, President Pump also uh, was operating. Now it was named after President Grant. Uh, he was the uh, sitting U.S. president in 1872 when the uh, when the pump was inaugurated. There's an old story that uh, that the president was invited to come to the inauguration. Uh, they wanted uh, President Grant to be there to give a short speech, pull the lever, start the engine. Um, he failed to show, according to legend. No one. Uh, uh, various stories about that, uh, but if you know anything about President Grant, most of the stories involved alcohol. And um, uh, the, the view, uh, the legend was that uh, he was on his way up to, uh, to Freensville to uh, give his speech, pull the lever, start the pump, uh, made the decision the night before that he wanted to visit an old uh, Civil War buddy in Trum Trumbauerville. And um, uh, anyway, problem was he, had a, he didn't get up uh, early enough the following morning, morning to, uh, to get to the get to the uh, presentation. You know, I've uh, done a lot of research on that. I, I don't think it's true. Uh, from what I can tell, he was, uh, he, was in a, he was at a cocktail party the night before in Washington. So he may, he may, he may have woken up the next day uh, not feeling uh, all that great, but, uh, but uh, I don't think it was true that he had uh, accepted the invitation to come to, to start the engine. So uh, just a little bit more uh, on the engine. Uh, when this uh, engine started up, uh, people came from all over the world to see it. Uh, this is uh, a quote from uh, uh, the chief engineer of a company called uh, John Cockrell, uh, which is in Belgium. That name probably doesn't mean much today, but uh, in the 19th century, uh, Cockrell companies of Belgium were the largest industrial companies in the world. Uh, it was a, a vertically integrated, uh, from coal all the way through the steel mills. And uh, their chief engineer came over to, to America uh, in part to see this engine. And here's the sectional view of the cylinder. You can see it was a hemispherical type uh, um, uh, design. Uh, there's a, uh, I, I added this uh, six foot tall uh, uh, workman to the, uh, to the uh, sketch just to get a, Uh, 
there's that, that central cylinder. This is a 90 inch one in Cornwall with uh, three guys inside it. Uh, you have to imagine that the cylinder on the president pump was uh, bigger than this. It was a hundred inch cylinder. So uh, supposedly when that cylinder was delivered to the job site, uh, the company held a banquet inside it. I'm not sure exactly how they set that up, but uh, uh, that's the legend that they were able to uh, have a little party inside the cylinder when it, uh, when it showed up on the job site. Um, although this is certainly a, a testament to, uh, to Cornish uh, uh, design and technology, uh, engine design and technology, uh, because uh, uh, John West, the designer, was from Cornwall. Uh, the actual manufacturer of this pump was in Philadelphia, and uh, two uh, two very well known Philadelphia foundries were involved. One called uh, the Port Richmond uh, found Foundry of I. P. Morris, and the other one the American Sons uh, Foundry, and uh, both of them did all the parts and pieces of it. The uh, the uh, Morris Foundry mostly uh, handled the boilers and pumps and American Sons uh, did the engine itself. And when this was completed, uh, newspapers from the New York Times to the South Australian Advertiser uh, talked about this engine, saying that it was the largest stationary engine in the world. And I, you know, I've done a lot of extensive research on that just to say, well, you know, is this a uh, hyperbole or is it in fact true? And uh, uh, what I've uh, been able to determine is it is in fact a true if you add the uh, statement that it's the largest uh, single cylinder stationary engine in the world, there's all kinds of different engine designs. But if you take, uh, take into account the fact that this was a single cylinder engine, uh, it is indeed the largest uh, steam cylinder, uh, single cylinder stationary engine ever made anywhere. So uh, this is the uh, building that the President uh, engine was housed in. You can, uh, uh, this, uh, just to build this out a bit, uh, the engine was actually inside the, uh, uh, the stone part of the house uh, and uh, the pumps were outside uh, going down into a pump shaft. And uh, the, this, uh, this actually uh, is the ruin that remains on the site today. There is a ruin of the engine house still remains. And you can see uh, from this photograph, recent photograph, the. Uh, the remaining ruins, and you can see uh, it very uh, most of the stone structure of the uh, of this engine still uh, still remains. So let's look at how the mining was done in uh, Friedensville. Uh, miners would, uh, on the picture on the left, miners would uh, climb down ladders to get into the mine. Uh, pretty rec no, I don't think any of this would be OSHA approved. Um, on the right, you have. Uh, some of the buildings. This is a, a mill building that uh, extended into the mines. Uh, you can see the fairly ramshackle looking structures for the most part. Uh, this is an incline that um, that uh, would take the ore up out of the mine through that through that incline. Here are a couple more pictures. Uh, mule carts. Uh, uh, this is a, a mule cart uh, collecting ore. Uh, one of the miners standing by the cart. Um, what they did is they would collect the ore, do some preliminary processing there in Friedensville, and then take it over Wyandotte Hill into Bethlehem. Uh, initially, they used pack mules because the road wasn't good enough, but as the road was further developed, they used uh, mule carts to, uh, to get the ore into Bethlehem. Uh, with all the water that was being pulled out of the mine, this is the uh, president pump uh, here. And uh, the sluice uh, took the water uh, down. Well, after it was extracted from the mine, they went out through audits uh, to uh, Socken Creek. Um, here are a few more pictures showing some of those horizontal shafts through the mine. You can see they look uh, pretty, uh, pretty primitive, and they were. They were actually very narrow. Uh, but uh, again, uh, Cornish technology was, uh, was used to, uh, to carve these um, these through the, uh, through the mine shafts. Uh, and there's actually a fairly sophisticated wood timbering used to, uh, to uh, keep them accessible and open. So the 19th century mines operated uh, from uh, 1853. Uh, we talked about Samuel Wetherill and Joseph Wharton about how water became a huge problem. 
And uh, the mines all closed in the area in 1893. Uh, although, they, they, although the mines operated uh, in the 1880s, uh, it became more and more sort of batch operations as they would get contracts. Because what they found was the, uh, the, uh, the zinc was uh, particularly good for um, making brass gun cartridges. And as particularly European governments were building up their armed forces in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1890s, um, they were having difficulty finding zinc ore, which um, uh, was suitable for making brass gun cartridges. They were having a lot of problems as weapons became more automated with uh, the gun cartridges sticking in the barrels. And what they found is when they used the Friedensville ore, uh, because it was very low in impurities, that they, they had less problems with uh, with uh, guns overheating and the cartridge sticking. So, so they got a lot of contracts from the British government, the Turkish government, the Russian government, as they were building up their forces. But as that started to uh, uh, decline, and other sources were found that uh, uh, had similar properties, um, uh, they, uh, uh, they it got to a point by 1893 they were no longer able to operate the mines. And so uh, the uh, engine was scrapped. The present engine was scrapped in 1900. Uh, a company called New Jersey Zinc Company bought the property in 1899. However, they did not have any immediate plans to operate the mines. They, um, they bought it uh, basically for the future and probably to keep others from using it because uh, New Jersey Zinc was in the process of creating a conglomerate, uh, really trying to monopolize, if you will, the zinc industry. And uh, so the President Pump disappeared in 1900, uh, turned to scrap. It, uh, interestingly enough, the scrap metal went back to the same uh, foundries that originally built the engine, and it was turned into uh, a, a battleship known as the USS Maine. Uh, you may uh, remember the USS Maine from the uh, Spanish-American War. Uh, remember the Maine, right? And uh, this was not that uh, ship. Uh, this was the ship that replaced that ship. So uh, the USS Maine number one uh, went down in Havana Harbor. This was USS Maine number two, and it was launched in, uh, I think, 1901. So uh, uh, that's where the uh, present engine uh, ended up. Uh, what does remain is one of the, we talked about the uh, 20 boilers. Uh, one of those boilers uh, it still exists. And it is in the basement of a furniture shop, a uh, no longer operating furniture shop in, uh, in Allentown, Front Street in Allentown. And uh, they were building this shop uh, in 1900. They needed a, a water tank. Uh, they, so they took uh, one of the uh, uh, boilers from the president, put it in, uh, in the shop while they were building it. So it's, uh, it's 36 inches in diameter, 30 feet long. Uh, actually no way to get it out of there. And the only way they got it in there is because they put it in while they were building the building. So uh, we've got a chance to uh, go down and take a look at this. It's a big riveted uh, boiler, very interesting. So uh, uh, hopefully someday if we can actually create a heritage site at, uh, at Friedensville, maybe we can uh, get that boiler back there, who knows. So after the mines closed, what happened uh, is uh, rather quickly, the uh, mine pit filled with water, as you can, imagine with the water flow that they had. And um, it became a swimming spot uh, for uh, local residents. Uh, the, uh, the structure itself became known uh, as, uh, some called it high stacks because of its uh, uh, tall 250 foot brick chimneys. And you can see that pretty clearly on this uh, sketch. Others called it the Friedensville rabbit uh, because uh, they thought it looked like a crouching hare. But it, big, as I said, the area became a, a very popular uh, swim zone uh, in the uh, early part of the uh, 20th century. New Jersey Sink uh, continued to uh, do exploration on the property. Uh, around the time of World War I, they were exploring underground at one of the, at the New Hartman mine, which was the only one of the 19th century mines that was underground, uh, fully underground. And they were doing uh, exploration there in, uh, in, as I said, around World War I, uh, testing, seeing whether or not uh, it might be profitable to reopen the mines. But uh, actual mining after World War II, 
after World War II, the price of zinc uh, became uh, such that uh, it made sense, uh, economic sense, to take a look at reopening the mines. And mine uh, development started in the late 1940s, and the mine actually reopened in 1958. Uh, here are some photos of, um, of the mine. If you're, again, from the uh, local area, you may recognize uh, this building, which is on uh, Camp Meeting Road in uh, Upper Saucon Township. That was the mine offices. Uh, that's the mill building behind, behind it. Uh, this uh, head frame uh, or hoist uh, coming out of the mine is uh, no longer there, but the balance of the buildings are. Uh, this mine was entirely underground. Uh, you can see here uh, uh, this uh, piece of machinery is called a giraffe. It's uh, scaling the, uh, the side of the mine. You have uh, down here heavy lifting equipment uh, moving ore within the mine. And uh, over here you see, uh, you see the pumps. They had uh, <clears throat> three batteries of pumps in the mine. Uh, in, in the, this mine was entirely underground and uh, went down 1,800 feet. So uh, they, uh, we talked about the, the uh, 19th century where they were dealing with uh, up to uh, 25 million gallons of water a day or 17,000 gallons a, a minute. Here in the uh, 20th century, at times, they had uh, water flows exceeding 40,000 gallons per minute of water that had to be removed. And now, of course, they had the advantage of having electric pumps uh, to uh, do that, batteries of electric pumps. Uh, they didn't uh, just rely on one uh, single cylinder steam engine to, uh, to remove that water. But of course, it was still very expensive. And uh, this mine uh, closed operations in 1983. So uh, <clears throat> when we look at it overall, about uh, 250 tons of zinc was uh, produced in the 19th century. In the 20th century, about 900,000 tons. One of the interesting things uh, is that uh, in the uh, 19th century, because they were dealing with, uh, uh, with ore that was closer to the surface, it actually had a much higher percent of zinc concentration, about 30% in the uh, 20th century, uh, the zinc ore concentration when they were down in the deep mines was only five to six percent. So it was much, uh, the zinc concentration was much lower. Uh, this is a picture, uh, kind of bird's eye view of the area. And you can see, uh, again, if you're a, a local, you'll know, you'll recognize uh, this is the, uh, the promenade mall. Uh, this is the Aldi uh, warehouse. Um, this is the campus of um, Penn State, Lehigh Valley campus. And these, uh, what these red lines are, this is the underground uh, 20th century New Jersey zinc mine. And you can see it uh, was over here where we have, uh, uh, where was the Center Valley Golf Course. It's no longer open, it's closed. And you can see all the uh, mining uh, tunnels that, uh, or shafts that are underneath that area. Um, I've often thought uh, when I go by, I look at the, uh, uh, I always like, type, like to look at the uh, Penn State parking lot to be sure all the cars are still there because the uh, mine shafts run right under the uh, parking lot. Um, I got interested in this area. Uh, I, I'm a local to the area, but I've always had some interest in it. But I, I really got interested in trying to preserve the heritage when one of the uh, uh, historic structures here in uh, in Upper Saucon Township uh, was lost. There was a building called the Mine Master House. And this is where the, uh, in the 19th century, 1880s, 1890s, the mine captain or mine master, the, the superintendent of the mines lived. And uh, this uh, house was part of a, a historic district that we have in Upper Saucon called the uh, Uberoth Zinc Mine Historic District. And this house was lost to development. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I guess fortunate enough to get a get the uh, get the job of putting a sign up, uh, a little sign that in, indicates where the house was. But uh, to be uh, completely honest with you, I'd much rather have the have the house. But unfortunately, it was deemed uh, not uh, uh, feasible to to restore it. And uh, as I said now we have a not unattractive, but we have a, it's been replaced by a small. Uh, uh, a small office uh, suite complex. 
So, um, you know, let's talk about the, uh, the location today. Uh, these are various photos uh, from around the uh, Uberoth and Hartman mine properties today. And you can see it's uh, identified by, uh, uh, known as LU-12. And what LU-12 stands for, Lehigh University 12. So this is uh, one of Lehigh University's properties. Um, Lehigh University actually has about 700 acres in Saucon Valley area. Uh, they acquired that through, uh, through a gentleman, one of their graduates by name of Don Stabler. And uh, Don Stabler, uh, who he's, he's passed, but John, Don Stabler was uh, very generous to Lehigh. If you're familiar with Lehigh, you can go around and there's a number of buildings that have his name on. You may be familiar with the Stabler Center. And uh, when he uh, uh, passed, uh, uh, his wife uh, was still uh, living. They had no children, no living children. And when she uh, passed away, the estate decided that uh, what uh, the Stablers would want is for Lehigh to have the property if they were interested in it. So Lehigh gave it some uh, consideration and they decided to accept the donation. So they uh, were achieved about 750 acres in, uh, in Saucon Valley through the uh, Stabler estate. <clears throat> but in point of fact, Lehigh's had long connections with the property. Uh, in the 1840s, uh, we talked about Theodore Roper uh, he later, when Lehigh University was established in 1865, he became Lehigh's first professor of uh, geology. Uh, other famous uh, 19th century uh, uh, legends in the Lehigh uh, uh, roster of alumni uh, also were involved. Uh, one, one particular that I'll highlight is Henry Drinker. Uh, he was the uh, fifth uh, president of Lehigh the only Lehigh president to actually uh, uh, graduate from Lehigh University. But he actually learned engineering at the, uh, at the plant in South Bethlehem and the, and the Freedensville mines. Uh, he was uh, visiting the mines uh, weekly uh, when his uh, professor of uh, engineering had quit Lehigh. He actually took up an apprenticeship with the uh, zinc company in the mines and learned engineering that way. So uh, that's just an example, but throughout these mines history, there's been a, large, a long uh, intertwined involvement with Lehigh University. So uh, quite appropriately, we've uh, been having programs with Lehigh University. I, I'm an MBA graduate of Lehigh, but I've been working with, uh, 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 with uh, Lehigh's administrative staff, uh, uh, Aaron Kinser and their, their director of real estate, and also with, uh, with their academic department, uh, Dr. Jerry Lennon in their civil and environmental group. And we've been uh, sponsoring uh, various programs at Lehigh to see how we could uh, uh, do things with the property. And one of the uh, main uh, areas that we've been looking at is the possibility of creating a heritage park. And we had a uh, cross-disciplinary -discipline, program involving a business, to, uh, uh, business students as well as uh, engineering students uh, who in 2018-2019 uh, worked on a, a number of things with, with, with related to <clears throat> how can we potentially uh, create a park uh, on the, on these, at these properties, uh, her, and her, a heritage park. And uh, what the uh, students were able to accomplish were, uh, one is to actually create a CAD model of the, uh, of the engine. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the engine was scrapped in 1900. We, do, we have not found uh, any original drawings of the engine, although we do have uh, sketches that were in, in Scientific American Magazine, as well as the engineer, kind of a UK uh, equivalent to a Scientific American. But in addition to that, we had uh, one Lafayette student. And back in the 19th century, if you wanted to get an engineering degree, even as an undergraduate, you had to... Uh, you had to uh, do a thesis. And uh, through combing through the, the different theses that were done at Lehigh and Lafayette, and Lafayette had a very strong uh, mining engineering uh, program in the 19th century, uh, we were able to find one student, uh, a gentleman by the name of Samuel Riley, who actually did uh, sketches of the President engine, which uh, we're pretty sure he took from original drawings. So our uh, Lehigh students, uh, uh, you know, they got over their qualms and went over to Lafayette. 
uh, were able to uh, uh, look at uh, Wiley's thesis, uh, do measurements and uh, use these drawings. This is just an example. There's actually about four or five drawings. Use these drawings, very, very well made drawings, by the way, you can see some of the detail and quality of them. Able to use these drawings to create a CAD model of the engine. And this is their CAD model, which uh, uh, actually operates. It's an animated model. So uh, the, the, the uh, walking beam, the flywheels turn, uh, the flywheel here turns, the uh, overhead beam uh, goes up and down. So they were actually able to make this, uh, create this CAD model of the engine from, uh, uh, from the drawings that they found. Uh, they also uh, made a working model of the engine. This, uh, this model actually pumps water and uh, they uh, did that using uh, additive manufacturing uh, tools. Uh, some of the other things that the students did is they, they did a, a survey of Upper Saucon Township to see what might be the interest in a heritage park. And uh, they've also uh, created some uh, uh, proposed signage and a theme, which is uh, to create a day in the life of a miner because uh, the uh, area that uh, 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 where uh, the 19th century mining occurred, uh, most of which is, as I said, now owned by Lehigh University. Not only do you have the mines there, but you also have the remnants of uh, some of the worker housing where the, where the miners lived, a farm where they would have uh, gotten their, uh, their, grocery, their um, food products, as well as uh, where the, all, the, uh, all the animals that were required to, uh, to operate the mine were, uh, were fed and housed. So um, they, uh, they, they felt you could create a very kind of fluid theme of from a miner getting up in the morning to going to bed at night and, and really kind of look ar go around the property uh, looking at how a miner spent his day, his or her day. So it was uh, uh, an interesting idea that we've uh, developed a little further. Uh, <clears throat> some of the other things that we've done with the property is uh, in addition to uh, physically getting the property, Lehigh's gotten a lot of uh, drawings and information, uh, some of the business records going back to the 19th century. And we've been able to take some of the uh, 19th century maps and photographs and use that to identify some of the physical remains of the property. Uh, miners are um, a very frugal people. So when they decided not to mine anymore, uh, everything that could be moved was moved. All the wood uh, that uh, uh, was uh, in and around the president and uh, some of the other structures on the mine uh, became uh, became uh, some of it became a new housing development uh, in uh, Emmaus, Pennsylvania. Some of it uh, became an extension on a local inn called the Limeport Inn. So it all became it all got moved around, and uh, so very little physical remains. Uh, but there are. Uh, various uh, features on the property, and we've been able to take these maps and identify what these uh, features are. Uh, some of the other interesting things we've done is there's a, a local inn, well, it wasn't in, now it's an accounting office known as uh, uh, the Manor House Hotel. Before that, it was called the Inn of the Unicorn, but in fact, it's been a, a, a tavern back until the 1840s and uh, was for a time owned by that uh, Samuel Wetherill, one of the early mine uh, uh, investors and inventor and, and developer. And he, uh, there was always a, a, a legend that he had a secret passageway from the, uh, from the inn to the mines. And we've been able to uh, take uh, some of these old maps and you here, see here where, uh, uh, identify where the tavern is on some of these old maps and uh, been able to actually uh, determine that there a door that's in the basement of the tavern and you see here it's in that red circle it's uh, hidden behind electrical panel but if you look down below you see the door we find that that door actually uh, goes into the mines and you can see on the uh, photo on the right I've highlighted the uh, mine shafts but uh, you could uh, theoretically I'm not doing it but you could if you could get through that door you could uh, follow those mine shafts actually over to one of the mines, the Three Quarter Mine. And uh, so we were able to prove an old legend that indeed there is a passageway from the tavern, or which is now an accounting office, but was a tavern, to, uh, to the mines. And the mo 
So some of the other opportunities we have on the site, there's a great deal of opportunities for archaeology. There's a number of uh, 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 the, the property itself has not been uh, really developed since the mine closed in 1853. It's really been pretty much abandoned uh, since that time. There's been a small amount of development in certain portions of it, but broadly speaking, not not developed. So there's a great deal of opportunity there to uh, uh, you know investigate the worker housing uh, remnants, which uh, are up here, they're just uh, pits in the ground, uh, stone lined pits, but this is uh, remnants of where the workers lived. Uh, you can see some of the surface artifacts that uh, we find on, on the site. So there's a great deal of uh, opportunity for archeology span here, uh, historical archeological studies. Uh, a lot of opportunities for, for virtual reconstructing, reconstructions, some of which we're uh, developing now which is, you know, how could we potentially take the ruins of the engine house and uh, if it was available to the public, uh, create a, uh, a virtual reconstruction of the engine. So uh, we're exploring those opportunities as well. <clears throat> There's also uh, opportunity for drone studies. This is a drone uh, 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 snapshot from a drone study we did of the engine in April of 2018. And uh, we're uh, looking at how we can use uh, some of the drone technology in addition to uh, uh, other technologies to recreate the engine. And this is a little bit of an aside, but uh, I'll just mention it. One of the other things that are on the site is the only Pennsylvania location of a plant called the Eared False Foxglove. And every year we have uh, 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 plant botanists from uh, the state of Pennsylvania who come out and uh, e explore the property property to see uh, how the eared false foxglove is doing because there's no other place in Pennsylvania where it exists. And uh, this last year when they did their inventory there was about 30 plants and it only blooms for a very short period of time. So these are pictures of it in bloom. Uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you where it is on the property because uh, uh, you know, we try to keep that a bit of a secret because it is fragile and it is endangered, but uh, uh, I thought it's just a little bit of an interesting aside. So one of the things we're uh, looking to do is um, how do we uh, create a heritage uh, park uh, opportunity? And uh, if you were to see the property, it's extremely uh, attractive. Uh, you have two uh, water-filled uh, mine pits. Um, you have the engine house itself, which is the most predominant feature on the on the on the property, and uh, so these uh, opportunities are being uh, currently explored. Uh, if we were to uh, fully develop it as a uh, park opportunity, uh, it would encompass uh, perhaps up to sixty acres. I don't think that's likely. I think there's probably some alternative uh, development for some of this uh, parts portions of the property, but it could be up to sixty acres and uh, would involve uh, perhaps up to as ma many as three miles of trails. And you could have, I, I envision uh, 20 to 25 uh, features on there where you could have signage to explain things that uh, uh, relate to not only the history of the mines, but also uh, uh, environmental implications, uh, ge geological implications, um, scenic of course. So. So there's a lot of different uh, uh, ways that we could have a very rich uh, open air interpretive uh, heritage park and trail on this property. Uh, really the first uh, in, and most important uh, call to action, however, is preserving the engine house itself. Uh, this is a photo from uh, uh, a couple of months ago now. And you can see uh, some of the uh, devastation in terms of uh, growth on the on the uh, engine house. And so what Lehigh has been able to do is get uh, uh, funding from uh, uh, from the state of Pennsylvania through a Keystone Historic Preservation Grant, uh, also through the National Trust, uh, the Lewis J. Apple Junior Preservation Fund for Central PA, uh, because it's in uh, in Lehigh County, that Lehigh County is considered part of Central PA. And we were able to use this funds with matching funds from Lehigh to uh, hire consultants to uh, remove the vegetation from the building, uh, to do a 3D scan and evaluation, 
and also do an architectural assessment and a structural analysis, all with the, uh, the, the eye towards uh, uh, preserving the structure. Uh, because um, it is the only uh, surviving example of a Cornish style engine house in America. So, um, so it's really uh, an important location to save uh, for a variety of reasons. One, it's uh, uh, the engine house. It's really the, 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 this whole supply chain of ore from Freedensville to uh, the plant in Bethlehem. It's really the first uh, modern industrial uh, enterprise in the Lehigh, in uh, the Bethlehem area. And uh, the, uh, the engine house itself, we talked about uh, how this is the largest single cylinder stationary engine ever made. And the engine house is unique because uh, it's the only surviving example in the United States of these Cornish engine houses. Now, if we were to go to Cornwall, you would find uh, 200 uh, very similar structures. And there is par a part of the UNESCO World Heritage uh, landscape. So uh, there's a potential here to, uh, to uh, provide a linkage uh, from this engine house to a UNESCO World Heritage uh, site. Uh, that's what's been done in Australia, uh, South Africa, New Zealand, uh, other locations where they have, uh, in, in, in each case, uh, just a handful of these engine houses still surviving. So there's a, a real opportunity here, which is uh, uh, important relative to our heritage. I think probably also uh, uh, represents an, an opportunity for uh, further uh, tourism uh, development in, uh, in the area. Uh, we've been very uh, blessed to actually have the support of the National Museum of Industrial History, which has really partnered with us, has been able to give us uh, uh, really supporting letters uh, to help with our pursuit to, uh, to get this structure preserved. So we have started uh, some steps, uh, one of which the most important uh, uh, near term was to actually get all that uh, vegetation off the building. That's been done in uh, November. We, uh, we uh, had a contractor who uh, uh, really stripped the building of all uh, or virtually all the vegetation. Uh, these are pictures from the site in, uh, in November when that was done. Uh, we've also um, We've also uh, uh, started with the 3D scan of the building. Uh, the uh, middle pictures here are actually, uh, are actually from the computer scan uh, that was done. Uh, the pictures on the, on the top row there are some of the uh, folks doing the scanning. But this is a scanning. They did, um, uh, this scan consisted of 760 million data points. So we now know if a stone on this building moves as much as a sixteenth of an inch, we'll know we'll know that it moved because of the, the quality of the scan. So that's a, that that scanning is important in terms of providing an historical record, but also important in terms of uh, uh, the ongoing uh, structural and architectural assessments, which are just now being completed and reviewed. So uh, having done this, we're now back. Uh, to the state uh, and to the National Trust, looking for additional funding to uh, actual do, do actual construction drawings, so that we can actually get start to get estimates to get the building uh, preserved. So it's uh, we're still at early stages. Uh, a lot of good work has happened, but uh, we're about ready to. Uh, we're kind of at that fulcrum point where we're not sure. Uh, hopefully, we're going to move to where uh, we have a. Uh, an engine house that's uh, been preserved. Uh, you know, we're not looking to get it rebuilt uh, in its entirety, just preserved as a ruin. Uh, and it can join uh, uh, other preserved engine houses elsewhere in the world. Uh, as I said, the one in, uh, in uh, Corn, the ones in Cornwall being a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And uh, we hopefully it'll be preserved in, inside a, a very attractive park setting where uh, it can be enjoyed by the public. Uh, so, and uh, not only enjoyed, but where we can uh, impart some learning and perhaps uh, instill the uh, drive to, for future engineers, because uh, uh, it, it was indeed a significant engineering achievement in its time uh, in uh, terms of what was transformative engineering uh, in the 19th century, and uh, certainly can serve as a, a way to instill uh, 
the thought of uh, being transformative into the 21st century. So we have a, a great opportunity here and uh, very excited about the, uh, the opportunity going forward. So uh, uh, just, uh, just to close, uh, we, uh, this is not uh, a single effort on my part. There's uh, many people involved in, uh, in helping us uh, in terms of uh, not only understanding the site, but with information. And uh, that's a picture of the uh, uh, Lehigh University students at, uh, at Upper Saucon Township Hall. So uh, just let me close with this. Um, uh, before you, of course, today you can't run out to see it, but uh, uh, if uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna remain optimistic that uh, in a reasonably short order, the, some of our uh, restrictions on uh, leaving our homes will be lifted and we can get out and enjoy the uh, world again. Uh, please do not uh, uh, try to visit the engine house. Uh, the property is posted, it's uh, posted for no trespassing. Uh, you can contact me either directly or, or through the National Museum. I will, uh, I can uh, organize uh, tours uh, of it, um, but, uh, and Lehigh University supports me in that effort, but, it, but I need to, uh, yeah, I need to be involved and uh, I got the keys to the site. Um, I'll make you sign a waiver so that Lehigh is not responsible for uh, anything that might happen to you. Uh, you know, the site, it does, uh, as I said, it's unimproved, it was a mine site. So uh, it's uh, not only helpful, but imperative that uh, you go there with somebody who uh, knows uh, how to get around uh, safely. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed the talk today. Um, so I can answer any questions that you might have. And uh, thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just making sure. Uh, I think the only question that we had was uh, from somebody that had asked, um, are all the underground workings uh, underwater today? Yes, they are. It's, um, it's uh, all the horizontal shafts are underwater. Now, what happened was in the, uh, back in the, uh, back in uh, the 1960s, uh, when New Jersey Zinc was operating, uh, the shafts were exposed, the underground shafts were exposed. Uh, one of the fellows that I work with, whose father happened to be a mining engineer at uh, New Jersey Zinc, and he he, he lived uh, near the mines. He and his buddies would uh, would uh, make uh, forays into the horizontal shafts, and uh, as actually shared with me some uh, interesting photographs that they took of it. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't think any parent would. Uh, necessarily approve of that because uh, the shafts are, uh, as you saw from some of those photos, they're, they're very narrow. Uh, the timber that are holding them up has been uh, waterlogged and uh, there since uh, at least 120, more like 130, 40 years. So, uh, so it wouldn't be safe. Um, but uh, at this point, it's academic as they're all underwater. So. Uh, I think that was the only question. Just a couple people said thanks, and uh, a couple people were tuning in from the UK. So that was very cool. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Oh, that's neat. And okay. I just want to say uh, thanks, everybody else, for joining us. And um, check out nmih.org for upcoming presentations. We have an online story time for kids every day featuring uh, industrial themed children's books. We also have, um, this weekend, we're doing a live streaming of a presentation about Bethlehem Steel Bridges. And on, I believe it's Monday, we have uh, someone from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History joining us for a presentation on um, historic mining photography. And we're, we have a couple other things in the works, so stay tuned to uh, our Facebook page here and check out our website at nmih.org. And again, there's also a couple ways that, if you're able to right now, uh, help us out whether it's using Amazon Smile if you're purchasing goods online, uh, purchasing a museum membership to use later on when we reopen, or adopting artifacts or using our online gift shop. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And thanks again, Mark, for that uh, fascinating presentation. Thank you, Glenn. Have a good one, everybody. Everybody stay safe. Everybody stay safe, okay? Stay home and stay safe. <laughs>